Hey guys, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to our weekly meetings. Uh, like UCF, we all know who we are now. Let's just jump right into it. So, uh, new thing this semester, if you haven't already, be sure to sign in. Uh, it's so we can maintain an active student membership role for you. And you can do things like vote once you have um, a certain attendance rate. In this case, it's going to be 50% as per the new SGA rules. So this will be open for the rest of the meeting. So you don't have to sign in right now. So if you wanna keep in touch with us after the meeting, here's the places you can go. Our most preferred one is our Discord. That's where all of our members are. That's where we're going to be most active. Uh, we also have a mailing list where we send out a weekly newsletter and any other things that may happen. Uh, we just send that out. We don't spam you. We don't sell it. We promise. We also have a Twitter. We, we sometimes we retweet things from people in the industry or any popular events that are happening. Um, and you're free to do that. So let's move on to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to go over some announcements. There's some competitions happening. One actually happening right now. We'll talk a little bit about that later. We're going to go over a tool time. Uh, we're doing that for the first time this semester. Uh, so it's going to be Nmap covered by Sachin. Um, we're going to then vote on the club budget. Th that's just so we can spend money, basically. We'll talk about that later as well. And the main talk today is going to be the history of hacking brought to us by the Quantum Jedi and Tupperware. Um, and then we're going to close things out. So we also have operations. Those are the people that help us run the club. Uh, they meet every Monday at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. The link for that is going to be in the Discord. It's on web courses. It's also on the public calendar. And it's open to anyone. You don't have to be a certain status or attendance. It's just, anyone is welcome to join ops. So one of the competitions going on uh, at some point is going to be Hivestorm. It's a learning opportunity for beginners. There are going to be teams that anyone can make a team but it doesn't need to be two to four people. Um, we can have as many teams as we want. So you and your friends can do this when it happens and you can compete to win trophy. And yeah, there is, I think a captain, I'm sorry, there is going to be like a role when you register for like an academic advisor or some sort of coach for you, for UCF when you fill it out. Um, if you ask in Discord, we can get that to you. We do use the Tom Nederost, I believe for the all teams for UCF. So that comes back to us. Also, Cyberforce. Uh, it's normally restricted to one team per school, but now it's going to be an individual competition. So you can register for this yourselves and compete for it yourself. Um, it's going to be individual and it is, you do get rewards for winning this. Uh, both of these are blue team style competitions. So if you're interested in something like CCDC, this would be very good to have um, if you're interested in trying out, that would be favored. And I think Peyton wants to say a bit about Seesaw. Yep, so let me turn on my, there we go. Um, so Seesaw as qualifier is occurring literally right now. Uh, Seesaw is one of the larger cybersecurity events of the year, especially for college students. It is made up of technically 10 competitions, uh, the primary one being the CTF. Today is the qualifiers going into the weekend, ending on Sunday at 4 p.m. EDT. Uh, we'll be competing in Discord, uh, so just type dot roll nightsec in bot commands in Discord to play along. Uh, no experience is required, come hang out if you want to. Uh, we'll be competing along with Clemson cybersecurity teams and a bunch of people from uh, UCF. Uh, next slide. So there's a little bit of rules I need to go over. Uh, there's a document there for you to look at later uh, when you get the slides. Uh, we can only compete, you can only compete each person under one team, only one team you can compete under. No sharing flags with other teams, no communicating with other teams. Uh, there's no num limit to the number of people playing tonight, but only four people can go to finals. Of those, two of those can be from UCF. So we got two spots that's gonna be based on performance and also like, you know, making sure that we have a balanced team, et cetera. Uh, only undergraduate college students. If you're a high school student or like you aren't an undergrad uh, college student, you can't compete with us, sorry. You can compete in another competition, but those are the rules for this competition. Uh, also, if you're a graduate student, you can't compete in this competition with us because we are uh, registered as an undergraduate team. Uh, high school students, you're able to play in red, which is like a high school level CTF, and graduate students, if you want to, you can make your own team. You just can't play under our team. 
Uh, no write-ups, no like discussing outside of the team uh, what we do during the challenges until after the competition. And if we end up qualifying, the finals are tentatively November 6th through 8th held remotely. Normally they're at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering up in NYC, but not this year. Next slide. Also, NCL is coming up. Uh, NCL is the National Cyber League. Really, really good training, especially for people trying to get into cybersecurity. Uh, highly recommend. Like, it's only 35 bucks, and it's essentially like a fully featured training with like competitive rounds and stuff. Uh, this is a very, oh, Kevin's got, Kevin made the alumni and grad students team, uh, which is known as NightSec Boomers. Uh, so just ask Kevin for uh, the creds. He just posted it, his little message in chat. You can reach out to him via Discord. Next slide. There's NCL schedule, the National Cyber League schedule right there. So the gym is like practice, preseason. Then you do like a competition round and you can also play under teams. Next slide. Also upcoming in next month is Clemson CTF. Uh, they hold a very good CTF and they'll be holding at the beginning of October. Uh, we will be competing in it remotely. So come join us. That one, as far as I remember, it doesn't have any specific regulation as to like if you can play or not. We're welcome to anybody join it in. Next slide. Also the virtual cyber lab. We've been having a lot of people coming through during the week. So feel free to slide on by. I've been playing some video games. We've been chatting. We've been talking about career stuff. So like come, come on by, come hang out. If you see people in there, come hang out. If you want to just drop yourself in there and you know, it's a socializing channel. So just hang out and that's that. Okay. Cool. So now we're gonna move on to tool time again. Uh, and map presented by Sachin. So take it away. All right, uh, we can move on to the next slide. So the first thing we need to know is what is Nmap? Now Nmap uh, stands for Network Scanner. It's, well, Network ma Mapper. I don't know why I put Network Scanner, but yeah, it's Network ma uh, Mapper, very creative name. Uh, but it's used to enumerate ports and services on scan targets. If you don't have much experience, that basically means it's essentially used for intel gathering and reconnaissance. I'll touch more on that in a bit. And it can also be used to detect vulnerabilities and versions of services. Okay, uh, next slide. Now, Michael, I have to thank you for this one. I just pretty much got this one from you. I was originally going to have um, a whole slide where I just, you know, put up an Nmap cheat sheet just to show the different things. But I figured it'd be easier just to show the syntax of an Nmap a command and just, you know, inform you guys that there are cheat sheets out there, so you don't need to necessarily memorize all this right off the bat. Uh, next slide. So how is Nmap used in actual practice? It's used for reconnaissance. I mentioned that earlier, but Essentially, you have to know what's on the target to begin to work on it. You can't really work with something you don't know. And uh, next slide, I'll go to the live demonstration. All right, I'll share my screen. Okay, for this, I'm using uh, Hack the Box just because it was easy enough to get a machine for it. I put the wrong password, okay. I haven't signed in there. I had this already up earlier. There, give me give me one second. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna be using this uh, blunder. I'm gonna use this machine called Blunder. Um, just because I've already done this machine, I know what to expect from it. So the first thing I'm gonna demonstrate is just you know, a basic Nmap scan, just default one. And we'll wait a few seconds. And what we should be seeing, it, yeah, here. We have, you know, if the host is up, we see that there are ports that are filtered out. And we also see that we have two ports here that we have actual information on. Now, from here, if we wanted to you know, find the versions of that, because we see like HTTP is open, but we don't necessarily know what's on it, we can add this tag here, and that essentially scans for what version it is and gives a rough estimate. It's not 100% accurate, but it's, it does the job fairly well. 
And we'll wait just a few more seconds. Yeah, there we go. So we can see this machine is running an Apache web server uh, version 2.4.41. If we were to actually browse out to this, you know, we could see that there is an actual website here. So yeah, that shows that. Um, we, if we wanted to find like vulnerabilities, like, you know, normally people would use other tools. However, you can use Nmap for that if you had a proper script to run. And you could also like try to brute force like passwords using another script, but I don't have one for now. There it isn't, really isn't much to brute force here. So I think that mostly covers my area. Are there any like questions I need to go over? Okay, uh, Michael, you can take it away. That's nice. Okay, thank you Sachin for the NMAP demonstration. So now, on next on the agenda, we're going to move over to the club budget. So this semester, we had to create a club budget that basically dictates what we're allowed to spend money on. And the people who can vote on this is going to be the active student members. Uh, I believe that's the people who pay dues and attended 50% of our meetings thus far. You can view the budget at the following link. And the voting link for this is actually going to be in the Discord to a channel restricted by those active student members. Um, it's gonna be held up by Night Connect. We're gonna leave this open, I believe, till approximately 6.30 p.m. today. And then at the end of the meeting, we will announce the results of that vote. Um, Addison is our treasurer. Is there anything you would like to add before we move on? I guess not. So? Um, oh, I was muted. So sad. <laughs> okay. I'm going to post the election in the active student members channel, and anyone who wants to vote there will be able to vote if they're active student member. Okay. So once again, this will be open until 6.30 p.m., and that's about 45 minutes for the voting process. Um, once it gets passed, we can then follow through with the budget and basically spend what is up to, but not exceeding the inline items in our expenses. Cool, cool. And I, I guess we'll just, uh, nothing else to add. So we'll move on to the main presentation, I suppose. So it's going to be the history of hacking brought to us by the Quantum Jedi and Tupperware. So I suppose one of you, uh, take it away. Hey, uh, you guys hear me? My microphone working? Yep, yep. All right, let me see if I can get this. You guys see it okay? Yes, we do. Cool. So I'm Tupperware, Quantum Jedi. Where you at? Sorry. Oh, can't really hear you that well. All right, I guess uh, Quantum Jedi's microphone is broken for the moment, so we need to get her a working mic. Please stand by for technical difficulties. <laughs> Everyone's having a fun time this far. Hey guys, sorry. I'm here. So, first of all, who are we? I am an IT sophomore at the University of Central Florida. I am involved in a lot of red team things. I worked for um, IBM's X Force right over the summer. I'm on the collegiate pen testing team. If you have any questions about that, I feel free to ask me. I'll answer them. Um, I use do use Mac OS, which a lot of people find controversial, but I enjoy it. And my favorite command is uh, Fortune Python to Kause, and there's a little screenshot of it on the right there. Well, ooh. 
All right. Hey guys, I'm Tupperware. I'm a computer science major here. Um, I've been a part of Hack UCF since its founding, and I've been attending meetings ever since. Um, if you have any questions with anything I talk about, feel free to hit me up on Discord. My handle is Tupperware. Um, you can find me. I hang out and chat every every now and then. So a little bit of an early timeline of hacking in general. Um, but first, the it, it, etymology of the word hack. To hack from the 1950s to 2000s means to use a computer to gain access to a system. It's not necessarily a bad word, it just is. So the history of hacking pre 1920s, in 1978, teenage boys were hired for Bell Telephone Networks to, to mix phone lines, to uh, monitor the phone lines. And as a prank, they mixed phone lines to connect strangers for fun. Um, the Telephone company, of course, um, caught on very quickly and replaced the boys. In 1903, um, the first, well, technology, the second technology prank, but the first, like, widely demonstrated one. And, um, 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 is when... Um, um, Maskeline disrupts John Ambrose Fleming's demo of a secure wireless telegraphy. Um, he sent insulting Morse code, and I guess the demo dogs failed. In 1932, um, Polish cryptographers broke the Enigma machine code. In 1939, Alan Turing developed the Bomba code breaking machine. And in 1943, Rene Carmille hacked the punch card system used by the Nazis to locate Jews. All right. So come the 1950s and uh, 1960s, uh, I wanted to start talking about blue boxes and freaking. So freaking is pretty much just the hacking into like phone telecommunication lines. So you can uh, make long distance calls for free. And if I can get my presenter notes, where'd they go? Oh, presenter notes went away. Oh, well, no presenter notes. Can bring this down, see if I can get them up. So uh, the Bell System Technical Journal put out an article uh, in the 50s really just talking about exactly how uh, uh, phone lines work and how they set signals to tell phone lines what to do. And something that John Draper found out, he gets his name called Captain Crunch because there was this whistle that came in Captain Crunch in the actual serial. It was one of the toys that they gave out. If you covered one of the whistles and you blew the whistle, it blew a frequency of 2600 hertz, which was the frequency that phone lines used to tell another phone line, hey, either cancel this call or make a long distance call. And what people did is they found out that they could use this to make long distance calls for free. And it was a revolution uh, at the time because what it really showed was Anyone could control billions of dollars worth of infrastructure. It was really important for people like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who ended up building blue boxes that generated different tones and including the 2600 hertz tone. And what they could do is they could make calls for free. They sold them for 150 bucks a piece. And something that Steve Jobs said that if they didn't do this, there wouldn't be an Apple. Uh, why is this all important? I kind of mentioned this earlier uh, that it was the little guys Taking, over, taking up the big guys, uh, billions of dollars worth, worth of infrastructure. And it was really also the birth of social engineering. People would hop on phone lines with people around the world. And there was kind of this like insider little hacker cult that started forming. Like now we have Discord where like hackers meet up and we have like Discord servers where hackers meet up. Back then they used phone lines to do this. So it's kind of interesting that they did that. Um, Something that they did, which is why the social engineering thing uh, started taking off, is because people started making calls to telecommunication uh, operators, trying to convince them they were someone else and trying, no, I'm this person. Blah, blah. So social engineering really started taking off. And Steve Wozniak uh, actually knew uh, John Draper, Captain Crunch, and he invited him over to his dorm. And uh, Oh, sorry, my mic cut out. Um, he used, so Waz used uh, it to call the Vatican and he convinced them that he was someone else. And he actually almost got to speak to the Pope, but it was four o'clock in the morning and the Pope was asleep at the time. 
Um, and, but some of these freakers talked to journalists. Uh, those journalists published an article and phone freaking was pretty much ended uh, because this article came out exposing all of them. And uh, what the federal government found a lot of organized crime uh, was really taking uh, place on these calls that weren't monitored by the telecommunications uh, companies. Uh, and even just like possessing one of these blue boxes could get you two years in jail. And Captain Crunch actually got fe federally indicted for wire fraud and he spent time in jail. Um, so after the blue box, uh, the internet kept growing. The problem was the way the internet kind of started out, it wasn't built with security in mind at first. It was just built to send data from one place to another. And because that was the sole purpose, there wasn't a lot of security behind it uh, from the start. So a lot of people started just hacking for fun because there were no laws to stop them, except the federal government would just kind of come in and start arresting people randomly. It was really kind of crazy. Um, so moving on to buffer overflows. So the first buffer overflow uh, attack was a malware called the Morris worm. It was basically a finger deep program on Unix system this, uh, that was used to respond to requests using finger program remotely. Uh, it, use it, you, if you guys don't know what fingerprinting is, it's basically just a way where one device can talk to another device and say, this is who I am. Uh, and he found a vulnerability in this and it spread to a lot of computers really rapidly because the internet wasn't really that big in 1988. It affected around 6,000 computers. Uh, it had the same effect of basically fork farming uh, the target. Uh, you guys are all familiar with what fork bombing is, right? If not, just hit me up in Discord. I'll tell you more about it. Um, in 2001, Code Red was a vulnerability that took advantage of Microsoft's web service software. And in six days, you might be wondering what this uh, 359,000 is. That is the number of internet hosts that got infected in six days. And all of those hosts were changed to their websites to say, hello, welcome to worm.com. You were hacked by the Chinese. Yeah, and 59,000 internet hosts, that was a lot of the internet back then. Uh, in 2003, uh, this, there was a SQL slammer that went out and basically what it did was just generate a bunch of IP addresses and it attempt to send out the same virus to those IP addresses. And if a computer was found and it was vulnerable, it basically got infected with this virus and became, um, unusable. Uh, it affected about 75,000 computers in about 10 minutes. And the reason why I say keep your laptop updated or keep your computer updated is because this infected about 75,000 uh, computers in about 10 minutes. And the problem is Microsoft released a fix for this six months before the SQL Slammer came out. And only because people didn't update their systems, a huge amount of computers were extremely vulnerable to this. Um, oh, and the Nintendo Wii. I don't know how many of you had a Nintendo Wii, but in the there was a Zelda game where you could name the horse. I think it was Twilight. Twilight Princess, whatever. Um, you name the horse, and if you just like kept naming the horse, you could buffer overflow the Wii, and the Wii would just run whatever code you had on an SD card. And people figured out that this was a really easy way to hack uh, the Nintendo system. So DDoS attacks, right? Denial of service attacks, you send a bunch of information to a server until that server breaks because it can't handle the amount of traffic that it gets. Uh, the first DDoS attack was against a big ISP called Panix. Uh, it was one of the biggest, I think it was the third largest, I, third oldest ISP at the time. Uh, and when DDoS became more commonly uh, talked about, there was a man named Con Smith who demoed a DDoS attack at DEF CON and he took down half of Vegas's internet for a complete hour, just completely knocked out their system. And this inspired a lot of people to go out and try to hack like big companies like Sprint. Don't try to hack Sprint. It's not gonna end in your favor. 
So we're just going to look at some operating systems that are commonly used today. Um, so Linux and Unix, it started at Bell Labs and formed eventually into Plan 9. In the upper right corner, you can see a screenshot of what Plan 9 looked like. It looks really like old now, but it was cutting edge then. Linus Torvalds in 1991 created Linux out of his dorm room. Unix is older than Linux since it is based on Plan 9. Some popular types of Unix today would be BSD and Solaris isn't really super popular, but it is a type of Unix. And more and popular types of Linux that you pro all are probably like familiar with is Debian, Arch, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Gen 2, if you hate yourself. Um, most everything would fall under these types, like Ubuntu falls under Debian. And a fun fact for the people who don't really know that much about Linux and Unix, uh, Mac OS is loosely based on BHD. Its actual name is Darwin. And then Windows. So why is Windows so hackable compared to Mac OS? Or why does it seem like it? This is a question that a lot of people ask. Um, and people can theorize about it, and y'all can theorize about it in the comments. But one of the reasons why is when you look at how many computers are being used comparatively to like Mac OS or Linux, 95% of the business world is Windows. There's a much bigger attack surface for Windows than there is for Linux and Mac OS. And Windows is also trying to solve a problem of compatibility. It's saying, hey, we want to be like familiar to people who are older. We want to run their programs and we want to run Windows 98 programs. And there's innate problems with that. Next slide. And we're going to look at one of the biggest, I, I would say one of the biggest exploits of Windows is career, which is Eternal Blue. And then, of course, WannaCry coming out of that. Eternal Blue is a SMB vulnerability. It was found by the NSA and leaked by the shadow brokers. WannaCry is malware that takes advantage of that. It's ransomware. I think it was the Chinese, South, North Koreans, some, somewhere around there that did WannaCry. And it, it lost millions of dollars. People got yeah. all of their computers locked. And this is another thing that comes from, please patch your computers. Like, yeah. So my yeah, so Microsoft actually released uh, released a patch for Eternal Blue a month before uh, it got leaked from the NSA. Uh, yeah, and basically what WannaCry did is it encrypted all of your system files, requested money to this Bitcoin account, and it cost people a lot, a lot of money. And the absolutely crazy thing is you can look today at the Bitcoin ledger for this WannaCry account and you can see that people are still sending them money. They're still sending them money. People that means, still not patch this. That means people are still getting attacked by this. Yes, people have still not patched this. Yeah. Like, come on guys, please. Oh, modern hacking. So PSP is a little more modern times. We were talking about stuff that happened way back in the day. Um, so very quickly after the PSP got hacked, people figured out how to put emulators on it and started like doing really illegal things that they really shouldn't have been doing. And something that Sony did was when they released an update for it, they put in code that if you try to go back to a previous version of the software, it would effectively brick your console and render it useless. And this was one of the first times where that, uh, where that happened is where um, you would update your system if you try to revert to hack it, your console would be completely useless. Um, oh, yeah, all right. So iOS hacking, is it le illegal, legal, what's the deal? Um, I don't think it's a secret that this has been, there have been like multiple lawsuits about jailbreaking, whether it's legal or not legal. Right now it's legal. There was a time where it was illegal to hack your phone, but now you're, uh, it's cover it's there are like exceptions in laws so you can hack your own stuff um so like feel free to explore um apple has bug bounties if you find a bug if you can hack into the phone and if you can report it to apple they're offering something up to like a million dollars if you can hack into the phone without touching it um so there are some pretty big bounties um, out there if you want to go explore those things it's pretty cool um and again just because I, I don't know why they left this in there, but 
when the Nintendo Switch, when the first iteration of the Nintendo Switch came out, it actually had a hardware exploit in it, where if you took a paperclip and you shoved it in the side of the console, if you shorted the pins, uh, two of the pins on the right side of the joystick, it would just shoot the system into manufacturer recovery mode and you could pretty much put push whatever payload you wanted to it and it wasn't very long until people had linux running on the system which is pretty funny so we're going to take some look at um, what hacking looks like in the media today so one of the biggest i would say probably the biggest hacking movie is war games it's a cult classic. I don't know if how many of you have seen it. It's a fantastic movie. Please go watch it. But the main thing with this movie is, it, let me just synopsize it first. Um, a young boy hacks into what he thinks is a video game company. It is actually a war game simulator. It's a like a war simulation. And he thinks he's playing a game. He's playing with military missiles. He's training a missile AI. And governments, real governments watched this movie and was like, hey, is this something that could happen to us? And the answer at that time was yes. And it was a scary answer to the governments. And I think this is probably one of the things that started having people look at security a little more closely than they were before. Yeah. Something else that's really funny too, that I don't think a lot of people know is that this exact thing actually happened. There were a couple teenagers that went to the same high school and they wanted to play around with hacking before there were laws in place to stop them. And they were trying to hack a couple modems and one of the modem ended up being something for NASA. And they hacked into it and they got in trouble. The lesson here <laughs> is, is don't do things that are illegal in the end. Thanks. And then 1995 hackers. Um, this movie is how I think computers work, and I'm not going to hire a technical director because, you know, why would I? It's a fantastic movie. Don't get me wrong. I loved it. It's, you know, that scrolly, like, the, the gooey that are totally wrong and display hacking, that, that's this movie. You should watch it. It's another cult classic. It formed hacker culture. Um, the Matrix, we get our nice green scrolly text here from here. We see that a lot in... Hacking GUIs. I, this is another classic. Watch it. It's great. And then Mr. Robot. Most of us love it. It's great. It is one of the best technical hacking shows of this decade. And it's highly critically acclaimed. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's really great. And just a little bit of hacker culture here. Here's some terms for those of you who don't know what they mean already know what they mean, want to know what they mean. And so, red team. It's a pen testing team. We focus on offensive attacks. It's typically in a simulation. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes they're hired by other companies to pen test them. That would be a red team. Or for CBTC, that's red teaming. Blue teaming are security professionals who focus on defense and hardening. So if you work for a security operations center, you're probably on the blue team. If you do CCDC, you're on the blue team. Black hats, it's someone who hacks for profit and personal gain. Criminals, they hack for profit and personal gain. That would be a black hat, someone who breaks the law for personal gain. Quantum Jedi, what is CCDC? What is CPTC? What are you talking about? Well, thank you, Jake, for asking. CCDC is our collegiate cyber defense competition. It is UCF's blue team competition. If you have any questions about it, direct them to Mr. President Teresi or Mr. Alex. Yeah, we have okay. we have a lot of people that that do this stuff in actual competitions. So like, feel free to reach out to us. We're more than welcome to give you more information about what actually goes on in real life and in competitions. So back to the presentation. White Hat is a security professional who will use their skills to protect the companies that employ them. So you're hired for a company, blue team, red team, doesn't matter, you're a white hat. You're, you're keeping the law, you're protecting the law, you're a white hat. Gray hats, this is a little bit less used, but in case you hear it, I will go over it. Vigilantism, just think straight vigilantism. It's usually, this is what I think is right. It may be illegal, but I'll do it anyway. I am in no way promoting this. I am just telling you this is what this definition means. Yeah, don't do this, you can go to jail. Seriously. 
<laughs> and you sign an ethics form. Remember the ethics form? Yeah. Um, script kiddies. It's usually a derogatory term, meaning someone who uses software or terms without knowing what or how they work, what they do or how they work. And while this is usually considered a bad thing, hey, hey, everyone starts somewhere. Please don't be that kid who is telling me I'm going to DDoS your server. Please don't. And then you're just going to run a script that DDoS is a server. Look what I did. You didn't do anything. You ran a script. And then, and then that's also a crime because you can't DDoS anything. Yeah. Don't do things that are crimes, guys. Okay, next. Oh, and our conferences, B-Sides conferences. There was one in Orlando. It is coming up. If you want to know more about it, talk to Peyton. He knows a lot about the conference. It's a great conference. Um, Wild West Hacking Fest is another one. RSA and Black Hat are more professional conferences. DEF CON is honestly one of the biggest hacking conventions in the world. It's in Las Vegas. It's in August. It was virtual this year, which is kind of sad, but it's usually where a bunch of hackers come together. They have things like voting villages and they, they just come together and create and hack. It's really awesome. If you have questions about it, there are people who will answer your questions on that in the chat. And there's a picture of DEF CON and- Are they just hacking? They're just hacking. Straight up hacking. It's awesome. Yeah. That looks like fun. And that is Black Hat, I believe. Can they hack each other's robots? I don't know. That's a great question. And this deserves, this was worth going over, I think, because we uh, hear about a lot in the Everyone's media. heard of Anonymous. Yeah. Everyone has heard of Anonymous. Yeah. Everyone has seen the guy Fox Mask. Yeah. Um, they started on 4chan as a troll group. They They are, were joking at first. They're not PC. Um, they're rude. They evolved into IRL play, pranks once they, um, I think they sent the Church of Scientology, like a bunch of black, they faxed the Church of Scientology a bunch of black ink paper so they're, it would run out their fax machine or something. They DDoS pretty much everything that they don't agree with. Yeah, anonymous is black hat hacking. It's yeah. the bad type. It's or the gray you, hat if you, you want to go there. You go to jail kind of it's thing. It's the go, you go to jail kind. Yeah. It's not a single person. Anyone can claim to be anonymous, which is the problem with it. And it made V for Vendetta masks culturally represent hackers. If you've seen like pictures of people in large groups with V for Vendetta masks on, that's probably anonymous. They're um, not really well liked in industry. Um, they will go to jail. You will go to jail. Oh, hi. I, I just threw this slide in here. So EFF, uh, Electronic um, Frontier Foundation, is a foundation that's built to protect internet rights. So everything that we've, that I've talked about today, all the things about people just kind of hacking online, not really knowing what they're doing, not really knowing what their rights are. As new laws get put in place, there's a company that, or there's this company, there's a nonprofit organization that focuses on trying to make sure that your rights are protected, your internet rights are protected. Um, one thing that they did is they were a big fan of the Email Privacy Act, uh, which requires authorities like the U.S. Department of Justice and um, SEC to obtain like search warrants in order to access emails and data in cloud storage uh, that's more than 180 days old. And before bills like this started getting passed, like FBI could just knock down your door and arrest you for hacking because there were no laws about it. Um, and just a little teaser, uh, I think they're going to come around sometime in October to uh, talk to us a little bit, which is a really exciting for us because they're actually a really big organization. Um, that's just a little teaser. So this is our, we left this time open. We have half an hour for Q&A. Any questions, all questions, I don't care if they're stupid, I will answer them. Next week, while everyone's still here, before we put her off, the meeting time for next week will be a bit earlier, uh, an hour at 4.30. That's just, I know it's kind of unfortunate for some people, but we ha will be having Paula Walto speak um, and their schedule just simply doesn't work out for our 5.30 meetings. So we'll have a new Zoom link uh, for that. We'll put it in the calendar, we'll post it in Discord, and we'll try to make sure that all that's figured out. Um, also, additionally, uh, we do have CSR happening right now. It's at four o'clock. There are people in the Discord right now competing. So if you are one of those people that were asking questions on where do you start, how do you do, and CTF stuff like that, that's exactly what's happening right now in the Discord with a ton of people. Um, some of them dipped out of this meeting a little early to go and compete in that. 
So if you don't want to stick around and ask questions, you're welcome to jump into that. It is currently happening in the NightSec group. So if you don't have that role, you can just use the bot to get NightSec and you'll see all the channels and the voice channels that everyone's in and working on the CTF challenges. Uh, the NightSec is our own Hack UCF team that we do for CTFs. We call it a team, but there is no barrier to entry. You just simply want to be someone who does CTFs and you just add the role to yourself. We only have the team, so that way when we compete in competitions, we can use the same name and we all represent Hack UCF together. And so if you're wanting to learn, this is an excellent chance to do that. That's in the Discord. We are approaching that time 10 minutes early. I will officially call the meeting now. So thank everyone for attending. Um, and we'll see you in the Discord. Seesaw, Virtual Cyber Lab, we'll all be there. Cool, cool. See you guys next week at 4.30. Have a good one.